Another very common feature that you might want to incorporate into your counter is called a load. Now, if you think about the functionality that we've put into our counter example that we're working on, we can take a look at this single process counter, and we notice that we have a whole lot of stuff going on. Okay, So the first thing that we have going on is we have its asynchronous reset will clear the counter. Okay, And then we have a whole bunch of synchronous behavior, and the first one that we have is an overarching enable line. So when enable is asserted, the counter will do whatever it's going to do. If it's disabled, it's going to hold its last value. When it's enabled, we actually now have the ability to count up if an up direction signal is there, or count down if the up direction signal is a zero. So we have a whole bunch of different functionality that's in this counter, and that's what you see when you look at this waveform here. So it's counting up, then it's counting down, and then at some point, the enable, it'll disable itself, and it'll hold its last value. A load is going to be something where, instead of just resetting it and having the counter always start at zero, we can have the ability to load it with a predetermined value. Okay? This is not the same as a reset. This is going to be a synchronous load. And the reason that we want to do this sometimes is because there's, as you walk through systems that use counters, the primary application is memory addressing. Okay? <clears throat> so imagine that you have a memory array and you're providing an address and you're just walking through every location in memory, such as program code and you're just going and you're reading and reading and reading and reading, and then you want to try to go back to a certain address and read from that. So you might want to have this thing free running for a while, <clears throat> and then you want to say, I want to load this with a particular value and go to there and then start incrementing. So that's what we have in terms of a synchronous load, and this is going to be an example block diagram of what we could have here. Okay. So in this situation, we have an enable, we have an up signal in there, but we could take it out if we wanted to. But we're also we're going to add in a load signal. Now the load signal is going to be synchronous. That means that we only look at it or we only re respond to it whenever you have the rising edge of a clock. And that means that we'll nest it underneath the rising edge of a clock clause of the if-then statement. And we'll see that in a second. But when you load it, you also need to give it the new address. And so what we're going to have is we're going to have a count in, which is going to be an input port. <clears throat> and it will be the same width as our output port. And whenever you get a load signal, <clears throat> it will just grab count in and then put it to count. Sound good? Then once you're done, it will continue counting. All right, so that's the functionality that we want to build into here. So the question now is, let's start with the test bench, okay? Because we want to be able to drive in something and have the system respond. So let's come into our test bench and we have our counter 4 bit that we've been working on. We have a clock, we have a reset, we have up and enable. So now let's go ahead and put in a new control signal, which we're going to call load. And it will be in standard logic. And now what we want to do is let's give it an input port called count in. And what we'll do here is we will have this be the same size as the output port. So this will be an in also of type standard logic vector, and we'll make it 3 down to 0. OK, so I've created my port for, I've defined what this system's going to be. And now what I want to do is I want to come down to here, and i got to make some internal signals for the test bench. So I'm going to make an internal signal called load TB. <clears throat> and then I'll make another one which is going to be called count in TB. And I can actually put it right on this line since it doesn't have direction when you declare a signal. So I'm just going to call it count in TB <clears throat> and define it the same width as my count output. Okay? All right, so I have my signals and now I'm going to wire them to the dot. So remember when you do a port connection, you're wiring it up. So when I declare this guy down here, I say I give it a name dot, and I'm going to give it the name of the system I'm going to do. I'm going to port map. All I'm doing is wiring signals to it. It's just like dropping it down and actually breadboarding up wires. Now I do want them in the same order, so let's go ahead and say after enable, I'll put load TB, and then I'll do count in, and there you go.
Okay. What we need now is we need to create a process that will drive in <clears throat> the load and the count in variable. Okay? Yes. Should it be count in TB? Yes, it should be count in TB. Exactly. Now, I come down here and let's do another process that's just dedicated to this whole load thing. So let's do, we'll call it load stem process. <clears throat> and let's begin. And what I want to do is let's start off by saying load TB gets a zero. So it's just running away. And what I'll do is I'll do at that moment in time, I'll do count in TB is going to equal something. Okay. Now, I'm going to provide this as four bits. Let's, do, let's provide it as hex, just because we haven't seen that in a while. So the way that you do hex, <clears throat> actually, I take that back. I'm not going to do hex. Let's try hex. <laughs> what do you want to load into it? It go, it's a counter that goes from 0 to 15. Okay? So we can load in something. Let's make it something distinct. 3, you say. Okay, I like it. So let's go ahead and load in 3. And there you have it. <clears throat> so I set count in equal to 3. And I never really need to change it ever again. So what I can do now is I'm just going to leave that there for all time. Is let's do this. I'm now going to assert the load after a certain amount of time. So I'm going to wait for, now we got to think about how long we want to wait. So let's go look at our, our test bench and think about this. When I have a synchronous signal, it is going to take place on the rising edge of a clock. So I want to make sure that I assert it enough time before the rising edge of clock and leave it asserted for enough time after the rising edge of a clock. So if I came along and think about when I want to load it, let's do the load like right, let's do it when it gets to six, okay? So instead of being a six, we'll go ahead and load it with a three. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna wait until about 100 nanoseconds, and then what I'm gonna do, so 100 nanoseconds will be about right there, and then I'm gonna wait for about another 20 nanoseconds, and then I'll take it low, okay? So the, the load should occur right in there. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this value, and I'll wait for 100 nanoseconds. Then I'll go ahead and assert the load, and I'll wait for 20 nanoseconds. And then from then on out, I'll do a load TB gets assigned a zero, and then I'll wait. Okay, so that should give me the behavior that I want. So let's end process. Let's compile this puppy and see if it works. So compile, selected, see if we biffed anything. Got a couple biffs. It might be that hex thing. No? 50? Oh, got to have a semicolon. Loves those semicolons. Compile, selected, successful. Okay, now what we're going to do is let's go add this functionality to our system. I want to think about, here's my counter, and I'm going to come down here, and I want to think about where it's going to go. I start my process. I'm sensitive to clock and reset. The first thing I do is I handle my reset condition. Then I move and I look for, is there a rising edge of a clock? Under the rising edge of a clock is where you install your functionality. Now, at this moment, we actually have an enable, and if it's enabled, it'll do all sorts of stuff. If it's disabled, it will hold its value. We can actually choose. Do we want the load to be within the enable situation or outside of the enable? I would say it should be within the enable. So why, we're not going to load if the thing's disabled. So that means that what I want to do is I want to put this thing underneath this if enable is equal to one clause. Okay. Now, what's kind of interesting is I could put it at the same level as the increment. So I could say, if I'm going to get a load, do this. Then I could say, otherwise, if up is this, do this. Otherwise, if up is zero, do this. Or I could nest it above that. So let's try to nest it above first, and then we can see if it works the other way too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if load is equal to a 1, what do I want to do? 
I want to then assign count underscore int with the value of count int. Does that make sense? And we'll make this, it was cnt uppercase. Okay, so let's make sure that we got that syntax right. So I got cnt, oh, I haven't even added in my port definitions here. So let's do this, let's change this port. So I'm gonna come over here, I got a load, that's an input port. And then I have a input called count underscore in, and it is also an in, and it's standard logic vector three down to zero. Okay, so I come along, I've got these ports, everything's good, and I am sitting here with just this very basic functionality. If load is equal to a one, then instead of incrementing it, go ahead and assign it this input. I put up a whole bunch of question marks there. And I gotta ask you, what's the situation that we're running into right now? Yeah, we have a situation because if you remember, the way you wanna do counters is you want the functionality of the counter inside of your process to be handled with an integer. That makes it very easy. You can use the plus operator, the minus operator, and you can also do range checking that's very intuitive. The issue is that if you remember, what we had to do to get that integer to be assigned to the out output port, we had to do a conversion between type integer to standard logic vector. Standard logic vector is what's on the outside world. And we couldn't do it in one step. We actually had to do, take the integer, convert it to unsigned four bits, then we had to take the unsigned and convert it to standard logic vector. So what we have to do here is something very similar in that we have a standard logic vector coming in and we need to get it somehow into an integer. Okay, so what's the syntax for that? The first thing that I do is I again have to do it as a two-stepper, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert this into unsigned and I've got count in. Think about this now. <clears throat> unsigned is just bits. It's standard logic vector bits, okay? Count in is also standard logic vector bits. Unsigned just means you treat it as unsigned. That's why you don't have to tell it how wide it's gonna be because count in is already four bits wide per definition, so unsigned is gonna be four bits wide per definition. Now what's cool is that this itself, this new four bit unsigned thing, can be converted to integer using a conversion function called to integer. And there you have it. So that's all I needed to do in that assignment. So I've converted my standard logic vector into unsigned and then changed my unsigned into integer. Okay, I like it. If load is equal to a one, then do this. Otherwise, just act normal. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna nest all this below here and give it true synchronous functionality here. So let's keep these lined up. Just indent them a little, just a little. So yeah. Right there. <laughs> and we'll indent that thing in there just to keep it readable. Okay, so now you think about this. I have this load, if this load does that, then I'm gonna say otherwise you will do this stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, so I've got my if load condition, otherwise do everything else. The last thing I need to do under here is put an end if. Look at how many end ifs we have in here. It's getting pretty complicated, but we can handle it. All right, that should do it. So now let's go ahead and see <clears throat> what kind of errors we got on that. No errors! <laughs> Life is good. So let's go ahead and see what happens. I come in here, and what I'm gonna first do is restart the simulation. That brings in the new compiled version. I need to go ahead and add in all my new signals because I've created two new signals in here. So let's do signals in design. Then I'm gonna delete all my old signals, and let's delete all the test bench signals and see what I'm left with. Clock reset, up, enable, load, count, in, count, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's run this for 500, then 500, and let's go back and see what happens. Okay, I see something happening here, and I'm covering it up with a hover over. Notice that count in is three. 
it's 0011. And now look at what happens. I come along, it's incrementing up one, two, three, four, five, and it doesn't go to six, it goes back to three due to the load. Okay? So this is pretty cool. It's this right here is in bits, but if you wanted to see it in as a three, you'd put it in unsigned. So you could see that that's actually three. So this is, it's actually pretty simple how this works. Here's the key to this though. When does the load take place? It happens on the rising edge of clock. So notice that the three was there the whole time and it's incrementing along, life is good. It was this rising edge of a clock that finally recognized that load was asserted. Even though load was asserted back here, the counter doesn't look at it. It only looks at these inputs as synchronous inputs. So it did not act upon that until it saw a rising edge of a clock. The rising edge of a clock went out and looked at all the synchronous control signals. Was it enabled? Was there a load? Was up equal to one or equal to zero? So it then evaluated those and then it did what it was supposed to do. Okay. Once it was deasserted, then it just went back to counting as normal. The last thing I'll say about this is who is the highest priority? It's up to you. Okay. The things that really aren't up to you are things like the reset, the way you code the reset, and the way you code the rising edge of clock. But when it comes to the control signals, these synchronous controls, you dictate the priority of who's handled first by the way that you code them up in the if else statement. Okay. So for example, do you want enable to be higher priority than load? That if you do, enable needs to come before it. Do you want load to be higher, higher priority than the up signal? If you do, then you code it differently. Okay? Okay, so that is a counter with a load.